we've heard some great stuff today here uh, about Lane, but I don't want us to forget about the success that we did have in the past, although we do need to learn from failures. Um, so before I start, I'd like you all just to think about one question. And what is the value of Lane to you? And we'll come back to that at the end. Our presentation today is short, but we're just going to talk about three things, which is what is Lean and Lean construction? Why do we need it? And the million dollar question, how do we do it? So I'm delighted to have heard the previous presentations because I don't come from a construction background. I come from a psychology background. And all my training has been about helping people to think differently so that they get out of their own way. Uh, I work a lot with athletes, work a lot with coaches, work a lot with business, where we see a lot of slowdown in the processes that they're engaged in. And a lot of it has to do with the big word that we have up on the screen there behind us, attitudes. So when Nick was talking about the notion of collaboration and the notion of doing things differently and the notion of sharing between groups um, and looking outside that circle, attitudes played a big role in this. And even if you think about your own organizations, who talks to whom? Where does information go? Where does information come from and how do we learn? So when we see this early attitude um, slide and even when we go on to this other one, you know, often what we learn from people is that they are too busy to ask for help or they're not confident enough to ask for help. And again, this is a wonderful initiative with the COP that we can now come to each other and go, we don't know how to do this. But it's the freedom and it's the security to be able to actually ask or state that within the particular environment. And that's one of the things that we're building up to. So when we think about attitudes, we know a few certainties. One is that they're socially constructed. So we learn how to think by those that we surround ourselves with. In some cases, we can surround ourselves with people that are going to help us to change our attitudes. But often, we need proof. And one of the challenges for lean thinking is that it can be hard to get tangible evidence that this way of thinking is actually leading to improvements. So while we're trying to get our, our whole teams involved in this way of thinking, you know, it's inevitable that there will be a lead-in process. So again, I was delighted to hear the emphasis taken off the tools. These are a mechanism, but it's a mindset shift that we're really talking about. It's from going from a fixed mindset into a growth mindset that's curious, that's questioning, that's engaged, and that's willing to be, uh, I suppose, challenged or pushed into areas of discomfort uh, and asked to be honest about what is not going on uh, as well as it could be within the environment. So quite often when we're talking to people, this, one, uh, this statement at, at the end of this list resonates quite, quite well. And it says, we're doing so well, why change? But often it's a smokescreen for we don't know what we should be doing next, or we don't know how to do things differently, or go away because it means that we're not doing things properly. So again, what, what I'm asking you to think about within your organizations is not only the tools that are available to you, but also what kind of thinking needs to be addressed so that it becomes uh, a mindset that the organizations can embrace and that people can work together with. So <clears throat> some of the reasons why people might be stuck in a particular mindset uh, can be related to some common myths. So before I describe what lean is, I'm going to tell you maybe what lean is not. So lean is not a silver bullet. We're not going to just have one shot at it and, and win. Um, it's not a magic wand either, you know, it doesn't just happen. We, we need effort is required. It's not a car wash. We don't just go through a lean program, come out the other side and go, we're lean, you know. It's a continuous, it's a lifelong journey. It's continuous improvement all the way. Finally, it's not a quick fix. We need upfront investments uh, in resources and we also need a top down and a bottom-up approach. We need to take everybody together. When we started our lean journey in Jones Engineering in 2004, 2005, we didn't see lean as a quick fix. A few people thought it was a car wash and we could get through it 
uh, and come out the other end as a leaner company. But when we started it and we started to adopt tools, we realized very quickly that the people that we were uh, connecting with in, the, in our teams were the main driver for our lean change and our lean culture change. So when, when we tried to uh, engage with the guys in our teams at different levels and we got a clear vision from the top to say we want to go lean, we want to think smarter and better about how we do things and these are some of the tools to do it and we got uh, our productivity manager involved, uh, he, he introduced us to lean practitioners and our directors then drove it from the top. But the best results we got were from the bottom and how we how we started that was through a common language, okay? So when we, we talked about lean, we tried to keep it at a common language level that everyone could understand. And the cup of tea uh, example is one that we used. So if we can just take everybody in the room and just think about making a cup of tea in your kitchen at home, okay? And I know when I go home and I want to make a cup of tea, I have a kettle here and I have the fridge over here and I have the sink over here and I have the tea bags in a different press and I have the milk in the fridge obviously and I have the sugar in a different press. So uh, if you start thinking in a lean way, you're, you're thinking about reducing the waste of the process it takes you to make that cup of tea. And when we got guys thinking in that way about how to do work, okay, they started thinking about moving the kettle closer to the sink, obviously not too close, because <laughs> we, we were still thinking safety. okay. <laughs> so. So move the kettle closer, get the fridge closer, get your tea bags and your cups and your sugar all in the one press. And now we're, we're reducing the waste time it takes to do each step. We e even got, got to a stage where guys were talking about only filling the kettle up this much or drilling a hole in the side of the kettle so you couldn't fill it up too much, right? So th these are the common languages that we need to use to engage with the guys on the ground. Because if you want to change culture, and, and the other guys here talked about people, 90%, <coughs> If you want to change the culture, you've got to change the, how the guys think about how they do their job every day. And that's what, we, that's what we focused on. When we started engaging with the teams, we thought the tools are going to fix everything. That's not what we got back. We got our greatest change from, from the people on the ground. So using a common language that, that suits your, your teams is how you're best going to touch the, every one of your workers. That's great. Yeah. Uh, so what is Lane? Uh, lean is a new way to see, understand, and act in the world. Um, and going back to Kevin's story, it puts lean in a relevant, easy context, context to understand. But we just need to be a little bit careful because lean means different things to different people, just as we all have different value from different uh, aspects. There's a video on YouTube, uh, I recommend you watch it, by Paul Akers, and it's called Lean is Simple. And lean is simple. However, um, there is a project manager for Sutter Healthcare in the US, and his name is Digby Christian, and he says lean is the hardest simple thing they're ever going to do. <laughs> so lean is not about working harder. It's about working better, smarter, faster. Um, in short, lean is about a couple of things. It's about a mindset change. It's about the basic principles, which I'll outline now in a second. It's about your fundamental practices or your tools. So that's the 10% that we're talking about in your small part. Uh, and then we're back to our common language and our common understanding. So the basic principles, um, I'll give you a quick story. So your value, value stream and flow. So we can think of a river and our river is our construction projects. So back in the boom when we loaded the resources, our river was full of water. So um, all the problems that are down below, they didn't really come to light because we plenty of resources. So when the river is full in winter time, the boat flies down the, the river. Nobody's in its way, no problem. But when the resources start to run a bit dry and the river goes, um, gets lower, all of a sudden there's waste in the way, there's sand in the way. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Getting too carried away. <laughs> there's sand in the way and then, um, you know, the boat has to go down the river and it's moseying around, so it's taking longer. You know, it's, it's extending the process. So the same thing happens with construction. When you hit the waste and you don't know where it's there, you have to move around. So that's your value, your stream and your flow. Your pull, when you think of, when you think of the river, you know, you only bring the boat down when you want the boat down. 
you know, when, when you have the cargo and you have the people, that's the only time you bring it down. You don't just bring the boat down because you might need it. And then our last principle then of perfection is, for many, is the most important one. And perfection is just continuous improvement. It's innovation, you know, it's moving away from the status quo. You know, it's, it's I suppose, thinking outside the box and moving on. Why do we need it? Uh, the graph here was actually the catalyst for establishing the Construction Innovation Lab there last year, myself and my colleague Vincent Gibson. Uh, and actually going back to what Nick was saying about R&D and visualisation, one thing we're looking at is augmented reality and how that can affect uh, conflict resolution. So um, we're delighted to be part of the R&D for this. Um, but the, this graph here, um, last, uh, roughly last year we had a presentation out in Intel and Joe and Sean were there and they gave a great presentation. And halfway through the presentation, I, I'm not sure if it was Joe or Sean, <laughs> um, but they stopped the presentation and they says, um, you know, we look at this graph here, is there any reason why this line down the bottom is flat line, why can't we shoot it right up? Uh, Intel, uh, they worked on Moore's law, which is a law that you have to half the, the size of your chip, i get this right, uh, or double the efficiency of the chip every two years. So they're working to this law all the time. So why can't the construction industry do the same? They challenged us, you know, which, okay, we set up the construction innovation lab, so that's our start. Um, <laughs> so they challenged the whole audience. There's 35, 40 people in the audience and it says, is there anybody out there that can't, doesn't think that we can dramatically improve this graph? And nobody put their hand up. So the other reason why I suppose then is um, just some of my own research I've done into the construction industry here in Ireland and how we can embed lean and the need for lean is crying out of it. Um, the McGraw-Hill report that was uh, on earlier, or, sorry, on next, um, that backs up kind of my research findings and you know, there's a huge need for it. So I'm not sure if anybody has had a chance to read the McGraw-Hill report, but it's very insightful in terms of not only the usefulness, again, going back to the tools in terms of being incorporated into different organizations, but also it does look at the people. It looks at the attitudes to you know, thinking in a different way, to acting in a different way, and to ultimately behaving in a different way. And it's hard to read this graph here behind me. But on this side, we have uh, lean practitioners and their perceptions of the processes within the construction industry. And on the other side, we have non-practitioners. And practitioners are defined as people who have been trained and who use it. What's most, I suppose, striking about these two graphs is that um, when people receive training, and this again, ties back to this notion of continuous education, continuous improvement, paying attention, is that when we help people to develop different kinds of thinking skills, we get them to pay attention to different things. So they become more uh, astute, they become more attuned to different areas of the industry. So we see that on one side we have 62% of people who classified the industry as being inefficient or highly inefficient. On the other side, we have 14%. Meanwhile, we have 55% uh, of people thinking that it's very efficient. So what we understand from the role of training, from the role of helping people to think differently, to communicate differently across their teams while they're learning a process, because behavior doesn't change when you implement a tool. Thinking helps behavior to change and will produce longer lasting effects. But as we saw earlier, it's a journey. It's something that has to uh, you know, be committed to, uh, be embarked on, uh, and realize that sometimes change is slow and gradual. What we see on the other side is 55% thinking that it's efficient. This is a huge I suppose, chasm to try to cross. Um, and the lean tools, along with this change in mindset, is what's going to get us there. But I suppose the message is it's not just one side or the other, that it's a package that we really need to start ourselves, our teams, from the ground up and from the top down, so that we're thinking together and that we're using the same kinds of language. We've had this before, so I don't need to go into it in great detail, this notion of how to overcome resistance. And again, what we see from the McGraw-Hill report is that the biggest resistors were the employees within organizations because they know what they're doing. At least they think they know what they're doing. They're comfortable. 
and now they're being challenged, they're being asked to think differently, pushed into a zone of discomfort for a while, as change always tends to do. Um, so again, it's how you create the vision, how you communicate the vision, and how you collaborate, not only at top level, but all up and down throughout the organization that's going to help people to buy in um, and then to understand how dissatisfactory the status really is. If you're, if you're looking at your organization and you're looking at the construction industry as a whole, you're, you're looking at what are the benefits of lean to you and to your industry. So if you can, if you can look at lean in a way that it's going to change your industry uh, from within your organization, then you're going to, to bring your organization to realize some of these benefits. So by em embarking on the journey, by engaging with your people, okay, and adopting the tools, you're going to allow your organization to get better productivity, to get better quality, to, to get better safety, and it's about smarter, better, faster. Okay, so you're not going to get there if you don't try and change the culture within your organization. And the community of practices, I think, is key for everyone, every organization, to realize that by changing how we think about lean in our organization, you're going to change the industry as a whole. And we need to get there. Uh, all the stats are telling us we need to get there. Construction needs to get there. So when, when we looked at it, about where to start, there's, n there's lots of different ways about how to start your journey, okay? And you can, you can start with uh, implementing a pilot on last planner. You can, you, can, uh, you can do it, and obviously if you do it that way, you're engaging with your people straight away. You've got some of the best last planners working for you already. They might just be planning it on a diary or on a notebook, and they're planning their work every day with their teams. They're planning their next week's work with their teams. All you're doing with the likes of Last Planner, and these are tools you use that, that formalize how they do things, and then we make promises to each other about delivering on, on what, we're going to sit, what we say we're going to do and, and how we're going to actually interact with each other. So we can make each other's organizations better in the industry by being leaner altogether. And the people make that change happen. So if we learn, with the likes of Last Planner, it's just, it's just one of the tools, and we'll talk about some more tools now. Learn and replan from the experience and organize to take those actions. Okay. So you're, if you learn and replan, so when we started in Jones Engineering, we looked at uh, processes that we could improve, and processes we improved in 2005, they are completely different now in 2014. Because we've improved them, we've changed them, Technology has changed, BIM has been introduced, processes we've used in the past are no longer relevant. And if you're, if you're lean thinking, you allow those, those changes to happen for the better for you. And you allow uh, new technology to interact with how you do your business and how lean that you are. So if you, if you organize to take those actions and make the promises to others, well then you're actually gonna change the industry as a whole. So some of the tools we looked at, and when we, start, when we started first on our journey, um, we looked at Last Planner, we've looked at Toyota Way, we, we initially started by value stream mapping and looked at process evaluation. And we, we found very quickly that uh, by doing the likes of process evaluation with our teams on the ground, you're instantly getting the buy-in from the floor up. And value stream mapping, Last Planner, all of these feed the culture, the, the, the change within your organization. Um, there's no, there's, as we said, there's no silver bullet here. Um, all of these tools allow you to engage with your, your, your uh, organization in a different way and to change how you think about how you do your business. Lean, lean, lean is the gel that brings all these together. You know, lean is not one of these. It's, it's, you can't, lean is not a thing. You can't actually put your finger on it. You know, it's, it's a philosophy, you know, so it brings all these things together. Um, how are we going to do it? You know, collaboration, okay. When we're on our own, we might sit there, we might have a great idea, and it might be a great idea, but when we team up with somebody else, all of a sudden, we've twice to create a capacity, our problem-solving capacity. You know, the old saying is, two heads are better than one, and it's right, you know? So, 
we multiply it out to three people, and all of a sudden we have three times the creative capacity, our problem-solving capabilities. But this is, the, this is the great thing. We got to four. We now have six times the, the creative uh, capacity. Okay? We go to five, and we have 12 times the creative capacity. Okay? But just because we put people together doesn't mean we're going to get the right results. You have to create the right environment for innovation and for collaboration to thrive. Somewhere where you're not afraid to put, your, uh, put an idea out there. Because if you put an idea out there and the manager can go, that's never going to work. I'm not going to go up and tell them again, another great idea. It might be a bad idea, but that doesn't mean you should be shot down. You should never shoot down somebody's ideas. There's a time to be creative, and there's a time to make judgments, and they're two different times. <coughs> Going back to Kevin, um, making reliable promises, you know, making commitments. And that's, that's the key element in the last planner. One, one of them is your pull planning, but the other part is making the reliable commitments and making a reliable promise. And I like to describe it like if you're in a meeting, and this has happened to me a lot of times uh, when I was in working in the industry, and you'd be in a meeting, and I'd say, Paul, can we have them row of houses finished with Friday, snagged out, finished, done? And I'd be saying, well, because I'm honest, I'd say, well, I think so, I hope so. Well, can you do it? So it's been pushed on me. This is push planning, you know? <laughs> and I'd say, well, yeah, well, I will do it, okay. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, yes, I don't think I'm going to get this done <laughs> by, the, yeah. by the end of the week. So, so, I'm, so what I'm relying on there is that all the subcontractors, are they going to get the work done? Because a lot of the work here in Ireland is subcontracted out. So, you know, reliable promises? <laughs> I won't go there. Um, <laughs> you know, so, and like, studies have been done where with traditional push planning, only 55% of the tasks that are set out to do on, say, on a Monday morning to be completed by the following Monday, only 55% of them are completed by the following Monday. Whereas with the last planner, uh, it's called percentage plan complete. So with, with the last planner, you know, lean companies are up high 70s, 80s. I've even seen 90s, you know? You know so it does actually work, and it's, it's, it's proof, I suppose, with John's there, it's, it's proof that lean is actually working, you know, and it's, it's, it's not a myth. Or bang on 9 o'clock. Uh, just quickly, okay, this is kind of how I started my journey. And, and once I recognised, once I, once I seen where the, where the forms of waste are and what the different forms of waste are, okay, um, very quickly because it's 9 o'clock, um, <laughs> the amount of waste in the construction industry, if you take projects at roughly 50-50, so 50% labour, 50% materials, labour productivity, if you go back to the graph, is about 50%. So that means like about 25% of the industry value is waste, at least, you know. So in that 25%, there is probably one, two percent for contractors' profits. I don't know, I'm not that high up, but it's one or two percent. So the rest of 23, 24, 25%, that's all waste. But that 25% is not there for one contractor or one designer or one owner. That's there for us all to share. That's all there for us to share. So we have to share it, you know. Lack of productivity equals waste, which equals lack of or reduced profit. If you waste our productivity, you waste our profit. And how do we do it? This is how we do it. 